Hello and welcome back to the Wisdom Factory. I'm Heidi Hanlein and I'm here in Italy. And today I have a guest from far away from South Africa. She is Lorraine Laubsche and she was, believe it or not, one of the main figures who have succeeded to make the transition from apartheid to a normal regime in South Africa happen together with John Beck. But it seems to me that nobody knows about her. And so I invited her to come on a video conversation and tell her story. She, with all the experience she has had, she was 83 in 2013. She did her PhD. Imagine that. We also do a, a, a series which is called Conscious Aging. And you are really a prototype of <laughs> how we can age in a perfect way. So without uh, talking longer, I want to give over to you. You can introduce yourself uh, in ways you want. And then we talk about your life and your sit the situation in your country and whatever comes up. I'm really happy that you are here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. It is a pleasure to be able to share with you and possibly to help people to understand what is happening in the world. Uh, I use Claire Graves' emergent double helix model of psychology. It's the emergent cyclical double helix model of biopsychosocial human development. That's its official title. And I was given that through Don Beck's mouth because I also met Claire uh, while he was still alive, spent time with him. But uh, it was Don that started me off on this journey. And you mentioned in your uh, note to me this week about the xenophobia that I'm sure everybody is seeing in South Africa. And Patricia, who you met there, uh, came this morning and what had happened in the city yesterday was sort of really horrifying. But let us face it, that we have xenophobia all over the world. It's just known by different names. If you look at Hong Kong, you see exactly the same pictures. If you look in Germany, you're seeing this people in the streets. If you look in Paris, you saw all the yellow jackets in Paris. You're seeing it in Venezuela, in the South America. You're seeing it in America, where they they just shoot people for no reason at all. And yeah, xenophobia, they just attack somebody and just for any reason at all. So looking at that, what is this? And I say it's a movement back to tribal. It, they, a move back to purple. Let us go back and have things the way they were. We've been through this before. We've been through in Europe, you've had the French Revolution, you've had the, the rise of the Nazi Germany, you saw Mussolini in Italy, you've seen it in Spain, you've seen it all over the world. You have these things where the populace starts to say enough is enough. And it's normally the purple, because purple thinks differently. Uh, no, I can't say differently. Purple has a wonderful way of looking after one another, but it's because it's tribal, whoever is in charge is an odd vote for them or follow their way, then that is the best. And everybody else is sort of, let's say, not good. 
So my journey has been with beige and purple. Let me just tell you that I met Don, I was working uh, at, I bought part of a business that was called SA Value, uh, SA Value Circles, which when we looked at Japan, what they were doing in Japan with their circles, they were doing it on the factory floor. But the people that were street sweepers on the floor in Japan, as I believe it still is today, you're literally at the point of going to university. And then you, so they are highly educated people with a broom sweeping. And so we did not have that. We had people that had perhaps done a year or two of schooling, but very little schooling. And so now they literally, because of the apartheid, they were just being used, their muscles were being used. They all had very good brains if you could open those brains. And so my job was to release within those that I worked with to think of the world differently, to understand different things. And once you start to think what I call outside the box, then people start to see things that they hadn't seen before. To me, it is the biggest thing that you have to do if you want change. Yeah. You have to think outside the box. How did you do that? Did you go into the schools or did you, how, how did you do I that? I worked on the factory floors in the gold mines with the people from underground. Some enlightened managers would allow me to choose out and I'd choose the, every level, every age group, every language group and uh, every tribal group. And then we would start and look at what their need was. You help them to identify what their need was. And I'll just tell you one of the little stories of what happened with the very early. I said, what, could, what would you change if you had the authority to change it? And the first thing that came up was the beds in the hostel. Now, the beds are double bunks. One man on top, one man at the bottom. But we gradually worked into this. And they said, no, they want to put on a place to put your barble and a place to put your ashtray or your cigarettes. And they wanted to put a cage at the bottom closed and a lock. So you could put your things in there and have them secure and that you could put your wet boots in there and that that's why they wanted it sort of, it was a metal, but the air could go through so it could dry the boots. Now, the manager said, all right, you can have, uh, I'll give you a welder and the material, but you've got to supervise the making of it. So they proceeded to make one and they put it outside the hostel manager's office. And one of the travelers came along and people that supply the mines, and he said, would you mind if I took this and made you a proper one? So he took it and they brought it back. They brought a whole lorry from, I was still in the hostel, what was it, about six o'clock or past six at night because I was still busy with another workshop and they brought all these beds and everything was already locked up. So I said to them, well, put it on the veranda and there's the hostel police, let them just look after it and the hostel manager will decide in the morning. Well, my dear, we unpacked, they unpacked all the beds onto the veranda 
outside. The hostel manager came next morning and all he had on the veranda was old beds. In the night, they had swapped all the people that had some influence, had swapped their old beds for new ones. And so all the senior people had the new type of beds <laughs> with the adjustments on them. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this is trouble. The ones that are in charge and have the say, uh, they can do what they like. You have the same thing happening with Trump. It doesn't matter what he says or what he wants to do, because the, he's their chief. Yes. There are certain people that will follow him regardless if it's right or wrong or correct or incorrect, nothing is like that. So when I, I, I talked with Heather McDowell about that. She is from Montana. She was also at the conference and she said exactly the same thing. She was grown in a purple family and she was explaining this. That's lovely. Yes, the purple is very important. People are so inclined with the value systems to want to become turquoise and things like that. I believe we're all going back. There's going to be a, a downshift. If I look historically, I've just been reading some stuff on going back thousands and thousands of years and some discoveries that have just been made, archaeological stuff. And that there will we'll go back to certain things. It will look differently, but it will be going back to that. So, because a lot of what one hears and does in turquoise, you can find in the Indian philosophies, the Hindu, the Vedas, people, if you look at... Gandhi, Gandhi, and you know, he was here in South Africa. If you read his last story, he was here, he was thrown off a train because his skin was black and it was a white truck. People in there could only white, had to have white skins. Mm -hmm. There were trains that black people traveled in, but they looked like cattle trucks. That's way back in my youth. Mm -hmm. So, how did we? Don Beck came to this country because of um, because of uh, Care Graves being very interested in South Africa and the tribal. You see, Care Graves worked with uh, Inuit Indians, mm -hmm. uh, and. He learned about all those kind of you know, the, the much in America that goes with tribal. Yeah, we called them red Indians, but really they were indigenous people. So he worked with indigenous people and indigenous Eskimos. So a lot of his thinking came out of that, the beige and the purple, and then the transition through red to blue. So you have to have, to manage, to manage the purple, you have to have red in you. But I'll designate the value systems in high and low. So a high purple is somebody, uh, Matsepi, who is the chief of one of the tribes where the platinum mines are. He is a good example of a high purple who looks after his people, who owns a, a soccer team. He owns, a, he's a millionaire, but he looks after his people and built soccer stadiums and healthcare facilities and things, or gets the mines to pay for it. But anyway, it's applied to the people there. So that you get that high purple, the low purple, like all the low systems, uh, is not very pleasant. High red 
uh, is the high red is very much a visible risk. So you have helicopter pilots and bungee jumpers and all those high things that are done, people that walk on a rope between two peaks or across Niagara Falls, those are high red. The low red is a calculated risk that I may get caught, but if I break this window, I can have the watches that are there in the window. You follow me? Yeah. So that, that, that high and the low, the high of the blue is loyalty and goodness and wonderful. A lot of religious people are in high blue. The low blue is what happened with the Nazis. Mm -hmm. That the rules and regulations and thou cannot comes from low blue. And then, of course, you get the orange, which is a calculated risk. One has to be careful with orange. It's got nothing to do with money per se. People want to say, oh, you're looking for money in orange. No. You are able to do like a calculated risk. So you get good farmers that make the right calculations to plot the right things at the right time, and then they would have a lot. But like what's happening in Venezuela, uh, in Brazil with them burning the forests, that is just red. I want it, I want it. They just want to break the window. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. 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 So perhaps I look at the value systems from a different, you know, going off point. And when Don came to this country, uh, Keith brought him here. Keith was a value engineer, and I, I've always done work with Keith because I'm a, a qualified value engineer, which is a, is a thinking program more than an engineering. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting subject, value engineering. And... In value engineering, it has a method in it. And this is what happened in Japan. Japan went to America and met up with Deming and they learned to measure. And then they met up with value engineering. And all of a sudden you saw Japan, computers, cameras, all the things that happened in the 80s where Japan was really there because of their, their value engineering. No, none of the big companies, Fujitsu, none of them did anything without doing it with value engineering. But I put the value engineering together with the value systems. So that's, that's I was using basically the value systems uh, and are you all right there to hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you well. That's fine. Okay. right -o. So when Don was brought out to this country by Keith, they brought him from the airport. And I was sitting in the office and they brought him in the office and he said, oh, is this the lady? So obviously Keith had been telling him something about me. Now I'd known Keith for many years and him and I had, we had lovely conversations about how, what kind of a house we would build that would have a vacuum cleaner that you'd have just a hole at the bottom of the house. You could either wash it, everything down with water and it would drain out, or you could blow air through and dry everything and blow all the dust away. You know, cray, what people thought were crazy ideas, but what we learned now today, it's thinking outside the box. And my husband and Keith's wife would talk gardening because they were both into gardening. So we'd known each other for a long time. And he taught me a little bit about the value systems, but then I sat with Don. And that was Don's first trip. And then 
think it's in the 60-somethings, the trips that Don has made to this country, I was his, I was his driver, I was his informant, I took him to places where he shouldn't have been, because he also had a white skin, and I've got a white skin, so there were places you couldn't, you weren't, as much as blacks were not allowed into the city after dark, whites were not allowed into the so-called locations, mm -hmm. okay, which are now called townships. Yeah. But they are still the basic, was the location. So, but I took him there and I went to show him whatever I could show him. And we used to go to the union buildings. In fact, they knew my car so well, I didn't have to sign all the forms. They just say, okay, go in. Because he went to speak to the clerk and we spoke to, oh, there were the four, the four Rolf Meyer, who's still in politics. And, uh, I forget all their names at the moment, so please excuse that. But there were four of them that were in the cabinet that were very, very open to whatever Don was talking about. Plus, he went to meet every political leader in, on any party. I remember us going to Natal to see Butelezi who is just given up the position of in, in Carter, has just uh, given up the chairmanship of being chief of, uh, of in Carter. And so Don would go, we went to go and look at the uh, ancient Wala, where the 24th Regiment of Foot, the British Regiment, were how can I say, were chased by the Zulus. You know, back in history, Don always loved the 24th, uh, the British Regiment. He had it on a stand in his lounge. Because every time I went to America, of course I went to be with Don, plus my daughter who married an American. So she's also an American citizen. And, uh, so I, that's how I continue with Don. He came out here. I'd always be at the airport to meet him and to take him, get up at three o'clock in the morning to go and fetch him because we had to leave to go to Middleburg Seal and Alloys at four o'clock in the morning because it was a long journey. We traveled this country from left to right, up and down sideways, wherever there was anything that was of that nature that needed to be looked at. So when I was in South Africa this spring and Rika told me, uh, she said, um, Lorraine taught to Don Beck everything about the country because she knew the whole system of the country. She knew the people. And so she taught him about purple and, and beige and Obviously, yeah, that it's very nice. Yeah. Yes, I was from experience also, no, because you had the experience, and I, as far as I have understood, Don was more in in theory, uh, and you came from the direct experience. What it means to to live in a country who who has all these value systems alive. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a friend who stayed in Soweto and which is a township just outside Johannesburg. And so she said, mom, come over. Ma, she used to call me Ma. Ma, come over. I'm having these ladies from America that I met in New York and New Jersey. They're coming over and uh, you come and we're making a chicken curry supper and come over. I said, well, what can I bring? Well, you can bring this or that. And I packed it up and it went. But I went at two o'clock in the afternoon 
because at three o'clock they put the barriers up and you're not allowed in after that. So you would be handcuffed and taken off to, to jail if you went in there. So I was already inside before the barriers went up. But that meant I had to stay the night. So I would often go and stay with her. And then you must come out after 10 in the morning because they take the barriers down at 10. So you waited until the morning and then you went home. But she had these three ladies and the lady who made the curry had promised her a big pot like this and ended up by giving her just a little bit at the bottom of the pot. It was, it was Thelma's and she is a Songoma. So she's a traditional healer. So uh, there was only so much curry and there were all these people arriving. So I said to her brother, come quickly, we'll go down to, there was a sort of big store there called Black Chain. It was a group that came from the Sutu set up because before that it was just little spaza shops. But they set up this big sort of more like supermarket. Let they open late. Let's go down. We went and bought more onions and chicken and curry and everything else. And her sister was there and I said, you top this up and I'll do this and I'll stir because you've got to be very careful curry doesn't burn. But we had to get the chicken cooked because you Chicken must be thoroughly cooked, particularly in this country. And so there I'm standing, stirring the pot. And what happens? The visitors from America arrive. And they cha 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 cha. And eventually, Delma goes into hysterics and she's laughing and laughing. She says, Ma, you know what they're saying? They're saying, Aren't I privileged? I've got a white housekeeper. <laughs> So this was a total reversal of the apartheid system in the weirdest way. They, to them, I was a housekeeper. I was the servant in the house. Whereas I was the white person. If I'd been outside the barrier, they would have been the maids and I would have been the lady of the house. Yeah. So you start to understand what apartheid was really like. Yeah. It was horrible, horrible, horrible. Yeah, and I also heard from uh, Johan, who was one of the participants of the tour, who was grown in, in, in South Africa and studied at university in, uh, in Johannesburg then, 20, yeah. 30 years ago. And uh, uh, he said they really didn't know about what was outside their, their barrier because the whites were for themselves, as you said, and they couldn't go into the black area normally, and the blacks were there, and they couldn't, they, they had no idea from each other. Uh, in, uh, maybe the blacks more because they were servants and were allowed to enter, but the whites, obviously, he said he didn't know. He, he learned it later when he was outside the country. So, yeah. it's, and that is so, uh, I mean, this is, you're still, that's why I say it's very purple. You get purple Afrikaners, you get purple whites, uh, all of these kind of things. If you understand your value systems, you can travel all over the world. I have been so fortunate that I've seen indigenous people everywhere. I've been to Brazil, I've been to Argentina, I've been to visit tribes in America where Americans just took their perceived difficulty and put people in, in reservations, they called it. was no different to locations. I've been on reservations all over America and uh, been all over Europe, seen various things there as well. So, so how, how do you do that? I mean, black and white, the, the skin color you, you see, and normally comes uh, the opposition. Did you behave in a different way, like purple? Did you understand how to behave so that the skin color was not important? 
every value system has a language of its own, a body language. If you speak to a, a body language expert, I am not an expert, but I can read body language. And body language is very expressive. So are faces. Faces tell you a lot. I managed to find a study that was done in America on a psychological study on what you could determine from people's faces. You know, the, the movement of the muscles under the skin. And this is what you very soon could pick up if you understand that, to pick up these muscles, what they're doing, so that you don't have to go by the outward color, you can go by the facial expressions. They had a wonderful exhibit, but it was all taken away, where they had every tribe in Africa going up to Egypt with the masks that they showed, and you could see the difference in the masks because you can tell in South Africa who is of German extraction, who is of uh, Dutch, who is English. You can see yes, it, it seems to disappear by the third generation, but even in the second generation, I can pick up of what the, the basics are. I've got some Eastern Europe in me. You mm. see the blonde and you see the, the way, but it's Eastern Europe peasant. Mm -hmm. So it's got, got purple in it. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was very purple. So uh, when, when you went into the townships, you were not afraid because you knew that you can communicate in the right way? Yes. Yeah, they're, they're, I, I've never been, a, I've been, I mean, I've been in a mine hostel with 3,000 black men and me, the only white face in the whole hostel at nine o'clock at night because <laughs> we hadn't finished the workshop. If the manager had known, he would have had a fit because <laughs> you weren't supposed to go do that. But I did these things. I did them way back. I suppose I've done it my whole life, so it wasn't a, a difficulty, really. It was just what was natural. I even have an African name. It was given to me as a child. And my Sutu name is Pusiletsu. And that means the one that comes after the trouble. In other words, if you've had a miscarriage or something like that and you're happy to have a new baby, then very often it's called Pusiletsu, which is the one that comes after the trouble. So in having that name, I've always used it. They even here, the nurses call me Pusiletsu, some of them. Ma, others call me Ma, others call me Gogo, others call me Mrs. Lapsha, and there's some that call me Doc. So I, I just answer to whatever I think people are calling me for. That's beautiful. Yeah. So you're seeing, I'm trying to give you a relief, reflection, not only of me, but of this wonderful country that we have, that we are so sad that things are happening to, and would very much you know, I think I've spent my whole life trying to make a difference. And uh, they wouldn't let me. I used to go into the uh, location in a free state town when I stayed in a free state town, Orange Free State, which is one of the provinces here. Mm -hmm. And the man used to say to me, we used to call him the devil, which was the devil, because he was a horrible man. And he treated everybody very badly. And he would say to me, if I catch you here again, I'm going to put you in jail. And I knew that he would, he had put people in jail. 
So we found a back road and we would go in the back road and we'd cover my car with branches or tarpaulin and then branches so nobody could see my car there. So if you rode around and then they take me into the hall and I taught basic sewing, how to make bonnets. My friend taught primer stove. I don't know if you know what a primer stove is. It works on paraffin and you can heat things up. You get paraffin irons that you light and you can iron with them. And uh, taught them how to make starch, to make hats stand up straight and things like that. You know, all the kind of things that were sort of normal for a housewife, we transferred that knowledge wherever we could to the people. And I, I can go on for hours telling you about those things of... So luckily my children also saw all these things and they were not allowed to go and take part in the, the sort of flag waving for the, the rest of the country. They weren't, and when the day that uh, Mandela was inaugurated, my daughter from America phoned me and she's crying and she's crying. I said, what song? No, she says, I now know why you wouldn't let us go and stand on the street with the other children and show the, the flag. Because it was because it was that flag. But I'm so pleased now that's finished. That's, yeah, yeah. It makes sense. She was very, she understood at last. So that was good. The other daughter, she also understands. I and mean, she's, she was arrested outside the university for protesting. Mm -hmm. She has a good purple in her as well. And has a lot of purple staff working for her as well. Yeah. I could, what else can I tell you about? What, how do you see the future? I mean, after Nelson Mandela, when he uh, left the political sphere, um, things seem, at least in our eyes, have gone worse. And can you say something uh, to that? Uh, I have a great deal of hope in uh, Cyril Ramaphosa. I've known him for many years and I know almost, you know, he headed up the union, the mine workers union, and I worked with the mine workers union a lot. So I got to meet him, I've sat at table with him, I've uh, I know he loves jazz and he always bought himself the best uh, acoustic stuff that he could buy. And uh, I know sort of to a way how he thinks, but he is fighting two or three battles at the same time. He's battling the uh, Malema, the EF, EF, What's it, EFP, whatever it is? EFF. EFF. And uh, there's Malema he's battling. They are inside the residue of Jacob Zuma's followers are attacking him. Uh, he is not Zulu. He actually is more a vendor which means he comes from very much higher up Africa, beyond Mozambique. And vendors are very well-educated, very wise people. And they see the world differently. But uh, when you're working with people that you can't persuade, and the democratic front people are supported by a, a lot of 
uh, white people that don't think in the right way. What are we still have here eight Londers? You know, we used to say during the uh, during the war, during the uh, wait, let me tell you which war, the Second World War. <laughs> Been about too long, my dear. The Second World War, you had what was called the Osavar Brandwach. You will understand that from your German, Brandwach, and the Osavar, which was the oxen pulling the wagon. It's an Osavar. The Var is the wagon, the Osa is the, uh, the oxen. Uh -huh. okay. Osavar Brandwach. And at the same time, we had the objectionable Britishers because the British came into this country and took what they wanted hmm. of the best and left the rest for us. So there were these two, the two OBs, the objectionable Britisher and the Osama Brontrach. And they clashed right from the times of Ernest Oppenheimer when he went up. And so he went into Rhodesia as well. So that country also got this objectionable British and some of the OBs as well. So that's sort of the history of it comes a long way. And as you can see, am I falling apart? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is there something else you'd like to ask me? A little bit uh, about how these um, conversations took place with you and Don Beck and how you finally uh, succeeded uh, all together to, to do the transition, you know? Well, from apartheid. there were hundreds and hundreds of wonderful people that uh, he spoke to. Uh, I'm trying to think all these people. As I said, there was those four members of parliament that he spoke to and they supported him. There were people in business that supported him. Uh, he took every opportunity. We would I would book workshops for him to come and talk and uh, they would then, people would come and listen to him and say, no, I want you to speak to our managing director. And so from one to the other, uh, whoever we went to, the communications department of the uh, Union of South Africa and they, the guy that was in charge there did a lot for us. We spoke to just about every government department, the head of it. So that was written into our Hansard. Hansard is the recordings of every word that says in Parliament. And this one a nationalist stood up and said, they got to get rid of this guy called Don Beck. He's talking insidious and he's whipping up people against the government <laughs> and uh, that he should be taken out of the country, he should be given a, a visa to come in. So, so and, what actually uh, did you do? You just explained the, the value uh, structures of the country and of the people, didn't you? To yeah. try to make people understand and they understood that it is against the government? Yeah, yeah that, because you take the to, you take the power away when yeah I, I can understand that. So uh, how did it go on? <laughs> back to your purple tribal things. You get the Afrikaner tribe and the Zulu tribe. I mean, we got eleven official languages. So that means there's eleven different tribal uh, associations, people that are, and then you're not counting the in-betweens of that. So 
we would have to look at that. So I was going to look at all the languages again because we don't have, I mean, we also have people that speak uh, Hindi and all different kind of Eastern languages. Chinese, have a big Chinese uh, in ja oh, Port Elizabeth, Johannesburg, all over. Uh, they brought a lot of Chinese people to work in the mines. Mm -hmm. But they opened shops instead. They were shopkeepers. Of course, the British also came to do the mines, but they're also shopkeepers. So they opened shops as well. So if you look at the history and the commerce in South Africa and the Jewish uh, people, there's Jewish roots in South African industry. There's a book that was written by a Jewish fellow, which is excellent, tells you every company at one state had a Jewish MD. Mm -hmm. So we've got lots of synagogues in South Africa. We actually have one that was in District 6 in Cape Town, which was the area that was bulldozed over. You know, you take people's houses away and you can take their property away, but you can't take what's in their, in their heads. Mm. What's that? So to me, it's always important that I try and put into people's heads what they need to understand. Yeah. That don't criticize it unless you're part of it. And if you want to help, help in a way that is positive and not a negative way. Mm. And we, we have these kind of things. So I went with Don everywhere. And I would say to him, as we walk from, from place to place, very often in streets, in cities, or when we went into the country, and I would say, now that is that value system. That is that. That's what's happening there. And being able to speak sort of bits of different languages, it was also easier to ask questions that he was asking to be a, almost a translator Mm -hmm. and ask people what they thought of it and then translate back to him what they felt about something. <laughs> so, and sometimes the language was very rough. <laughs> I tried to be polite to this enormous American that was here. He was very enormous to me when he first came out. He used to tease me unmercifully. <laughs> Always. But... Uh, we did, we did so many tours. I remember sitting on an airplane with him and he was saying, now we've got to have a strategy. Let us work out our strategy with the horns of the Zulu cattle. The Nguni cattle are very special. They have a, uh, the horns come around like that. And wherever there was a big battle, the Zulus would in, go around and cut off the supplies and everything else, just like the horns of a bull. Mm -hmm. And that was, there were things like this that we did. He brought Dr. Underwood out, he brought Chris, uh, Chris, what's Chris's surname? He married that other lady. They also wrote a book on spiral dynamics. He brought Chris out, uh, but Chris, Chris was worked for him for a long time, as he's he, when he was a student and Don was a professor, he worked for Don, mm -hmm. and then together they started to plan. They wrote Spiral Dynamics together. That's mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Chris got married, and the lady stirred a pot and the pot boiled over and that was the end of that mm. relationship. It was very sad, but uh, then Wilbur came into the scene and he just got the end of the story and didn't get the full... It's a pity he could never have spoken to Keir because he's got some good stuff. 
but it's all on just on one dimensional. It's not. It doesn't fit everywhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've gone through it time and time again. I was very excited the first bit, but then when it wanted to go deeper, it wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. So, and he didn't understand the value systems. He too had an ego that very often happens with these guys. But now we're into the century of the woman. So let us now look and see. You know what the saying was when the woman walked, the African woman walked to the union buildings to go and protest. And they said, you strike a woman, you strike a rock. Oh, wow. <laughs> so if you understand striking a rock, there are many ways it will break your weapon. But in certain rocks will give out water, if you look at it biblically. The rocks, where strike a rock makes, gives women the power. Mm -hmm. So how is it now in, in, in South Africa? Are there women in power? Are there women stepping up and taking over? Or how is the situation of women there at the moment? I mean, white and black women. In, in, like, you know, in commerce and industry and, uh, but it is, it is still very much a male dominated. If you look, there's equal amount of women and men in parliament, but they're not, there are some wonderful women around. And that have been there, Susulu, where her father was with Nelson Mandela. And as there are all over that there were women involved. But women are not in the same way as I've seen in America, or like the, uh, the German president. There is a, I think we have to first break the, uh, what do they call it, the, the gays and the lesbians and all of that. We have to, we're still getting used to that. I think as we get to the 20 somethings, if we don't wipe ourselves out with climate change, we will be able to see the woman come forward because they're there yeah. but they, as within any society the women are the backbone of it what i saw i i didn't meet a lot of of women uh i mean i was there only 10 days but the women i saw also the ones from the conference i now talk about the black women they have such an emanation of confidence and self you know, they, they just can stand like this. Why we European women are often a little bit, you know, drawing back. They, they are there. And I admired that, you know, this vitality and this presence. Uh, so I'm wondering why, yeah, they have to take over their power and make it value in the society. I think you see it, and I would take it in, all women, that once you understand who you are, you are who you are. Yeah. And you find it in matrons. I've worked a lot with the hospitals, and the sisters and the matrons of ho the hospitals with Rika. Mm -hmm. And they know who they are. I don't know if you met uh, the one very big lady, she's in charge of the emergency medicine. She's in charge of the helicopters and the transplants and all those kind of things. She knows who she is and she doesn't back away for anybody. But you know, when you've been brought up to very revere a man, mm. 
both my daughters' marriages crashed because I didn't bring them up to revere a man. Okay. And they came unstuck. And I've been noticing wherever you see a woman that's revering the man, the girls grow up as revering the husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Doesn't agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, you know my, my special friend, Patricia. Comes yeah, but... up, you'll remember the lady from yeah yeah i do remember her yeah tell me what i said that i i saw so many of you women having this emanation of vitality and of of power come into the the picture and tell me what you think about it you are first hand <laughs> <laughs> yes i have to say she will say no come put your head, head in okay now, I will say to her, like you said, and she's like, no. She's a very, knows who she is. She really knows who she is. But you've got to admit that there are a lot of other women that when the man talks, they, yes. they do it, don't they? Yes, always, uh, you have to listen to what they say. You cannot say no. You've got to follow whatever they say. It also uh, goes back to the culture. If you are going to say no to a man, you are said to be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. you are, yes, you are disrespectful. Disrespectful. Yeah. That is the old hierarchy, you know? Yeah. yeah. And even in a shop, what I notice is that, Patricia, where I give somebody a mouthful, and Patricia wouldn't, she would be, because she's not as respectful to any man mm -hmm. or even any woman. Whereas when I was at one of the big stores and there was a new little trainee on the till and the supervisor came along and he was touching where he shouldn't have been touching. And she said, no, no. And he kept on and I lost it in the middle of the store. And I said to him, you stop that immediately. I am going straight to the manager and have you dismissed. You are disgusting. And I, ha I went and reported him and I went back and he just laughed. He said, no, you don't know. I'm allowed to do those things. And I was not going to have this. It must be one of the suffragists that's been reborn or something. <laughs> So. Is it accepted um, in, 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 in the culture? Even, even in Europe, many women don't say uh, enough when they feel we have to stand up, women. We have to say what we don't want, first of all, and then say what we want and get self-confidence, you know? That's everywhere. So, <laughs> so that's very nice to end there. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad that you came. Uh, you came, Patricia, and I remember you in the in the um, uh, Da Vinci place. <laughs> yeah, and I sat near you, and I have a photo with all of us. So <laughs> very grateful, and that you helped Lorraine also with technology and with everything. <laughs> so great. She drives the car. Yeah. So she. Uh, she got a license. I said, now I'll teach you to drive. Good. You have lots of things, haven't you? Yes. Yes. She's a very good driver, very safe driver as well. So and you are in very good hands. <laughs> about people who don't drive properly. Now she complains <laughs> about them. So. <laughs> I've been talking to you. Yeah, thank you yeah. very much. I hope this is more or less what you wanted. Yeah, wonderful. And I hope people get to know more about you and more about, you know, a country I didn't know it before and I was fascinated when I came. So that's also the reason why I want to do interviews with you because I think we need to know more. And you gave so many information today of people and places I don't know. So I, I, I learn 
I learn, I learn, and I hope other people learn too. And as the xenophobia, which we were talking about, I realized that nobody talked about it here. The, the newspapers, the news, I didn't see it. We have so much to do with our own right-wing <laughs> populists, you know, so obviously that doesn't come into the picture. But you are right, it's a moment everywhere, and how can we be a good force to... To you just balance it. Positive within your psyche. Yeah. Your body and your mind, just keep it positive because whatever it bumps again will turn positive. Yeah. How did you say uh, we women are like uh, beating a rock? There can be come out good water <laughs> and it can also we can be like this. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> you little woman, you. Uh, no, what does it go? You hit a rock. You hit a woman who hit a rock. Eh? You hit a woman who hit a rock. Yeah. yeah. You hit yeah. a woman, you hit a rock. Yeah. Water, good things can come. For With the right know. way of touching. Yeah. The is, <laughs> will have to drown. And we will we'll try to touch each other so that we can, our waters can spring and nurture the world can't live without water as we're starting to understand uh, global warming is taking the water away and we need to start striking a few rocks at the moment. Okay? We do and I hope we did today and thank you both of you Lorraine and Patricia for your kind presence. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.